been with you, I'm going to you might have to come and celebrate three times because you guys started, or maybe just once to set the show. But you do your thing, right? You do that because one of you can always do that. Ready? Yeah. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. My dad said that he, because he worked on his car, so I think he said, hey, he can carry the whole car apart with him. I can see he's up in the that was metric and everything else. I don't think you can work on these two cars. I'll tell you a quick story about this. It's not very interesting. It's not very it also killed the oxygen something. I said, I think I ought to drink for a little ride. That's a new mission. I had to laugh when he told me that. I said, well, you know, sometimes you have those moments when you're not thinking properly. <laughs> Monday, June 13th. It is 7 Will you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? The Pledge of Allegiance is to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Detroit, Buchanan, Michigan. Um, I've got several. I really want you to look at this extension of the $5,000 automatic or discretionary spending by your city manager. I didn't agree with it when I was a commissioner. They raised it from $1,000 to $5,000 when they fired a city manager over spending too much on computers. But um, as a commissioner, I'd like to see a lower to full three. Uh, I was going to say four, but three. And this is not really taking away much power, but it's reducing the power a little bit. And the other thing 
Smokas, they're down here wanting a lot of money. I suggested postcards six years ago or an extreme visiting the senior centers here in Buchanan or Niles and handing out registrations for membership, kind of like selling insurance policies. I've never seen anything like that done. <clears throat> it's just too easy to come down here. And it's not just Smokas. I'm not just picking on Smokas. Everybody in Buchanan comes down here with their hand held out, expecting the taxpayer to fail them out. And the taxpayers are really getting tired of it. You know, especially when we don't see too much reciprocated back to the taxpayers. You know, I mean, I know it's expensive and all that, but there's got to be things that these community functions can do to raise funds without actually asking the taxpayers, you know, I'd really like to see them do the postcard thing. I really would, Sean. I've tried very hard, you know, send it to all the residents and see what kind of reply. If they don't want to spend the money on postcards, do a senior center at the Niles and the Buchanan Senior Center and see how many people actually sign up. Because I think it's $50 a year or $40 a year. I signed up one year and never got a reminder for the following year. So that shows you what you're doing with it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wish to make a public comment? Uh, yes, my name is Monroe Lavey. I'm from 118 Sherwood Parkway. And I'm actually here to rebuttal to what he just said. Um, as far as the $5,000 is concerned, I think that's absolutely fine. We have a lawyer that's actually sitting as a city manager. She knows exactly what she's doing, and she's capable. And as far as um, Smethkas is concerned, they come twice a week to the Buchanan Senior Center, and probably twice a week to the Niles Senior Center. They're very much in, they're very much in tune as to what we're doing, and they've tried the postcards. It doesn't really work. So I think that's why they've chosen something different, um, and we couldn't do without them. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to make a public comment? Okay. Seeing no one else, let's move on to the consent agenda. Yes. Swan? Yes. Jefferson? Yes. 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 All right, schedule matters from the floor. Why the Grace Nonprofit Special Liquor License Request? the sale and production of cannabis in Buchanan and specifically in the Central Business District. Uh, my past experience in Ann Arbor has showed us how cannabis can be integrated into the community and be a powerful tool for economic development, revitalization, and supporting a sense of community. Our brand of cannabis is rooted in principles of teamwork, empowering individuals, strengthening communities. We 
strive to be approachable, caring, compassionate, and positive management for your support. Delilah Grace Corporation is a 501c3 formed by myself, Anthony Hauser, and one lovely man. My is Anthony's daughter, six, Grace is my daughter, 12. Our hope is that we're going to raise money to provide amenities for First of these efforts is going to be the event that we're holding on July 3rd. We have five bands scheduled to perform and have food trucks. We're hoping that um, we can have a beer garden to supplement our fundraising efforts. We're going to try to manage the amount of people that show up to the event. It's the 4th of July weekend, generally pretty slow in town. Everybody is off. We're looking at this as opportunity to celebrate Buchanan for Buchanan. It's going to be free, it's going to be family friendly, it's going to be local, all the bands are local, the food is local, hopefully the beer is going to be local. It's not a cannabis event. Specifically our goal is to raise enough money to place a sport court, possibly in one of the cities. Something that uh, has been needs identified, but the funding may not be. It's uh, brought to my attention that uh, you know, use from the ages of 8 to 16 really lack places to go and engage. Maybe a basketball court or a pickleball court combined would be a nice addition to the park. So I'm here tonight asking for you to consider us to operate beer garden at a location, not on the commons, but near the commons, while the music programming is ongoing, to be uh, operated by River St. Joe, professional operator. So I'm here to answer any questions and hopefully uh, get your further consideration. Anybody have any questions for you? Well, we've tried a couple of these projects Uh, have you talked to the local church that's right there on that that corner because there was a fence prior to this it's been a few years back that you know there was a lot of opposition from like the, the Methodist church that's right there yeah, I believe so have you, you, have you, you talked to those there? folks and um... actually it's not the Methodist church what it's, it's the uh, it's the one on um, right across from the senior center. They, or the yeah. Senior center. I can't. And it. when we did this at the chamber, three, I don't know if we did it for three years straight, they've never objected. They always signed. So. If they object, if we have an option as far as moving the um, the location possibly next to Gustafson's, where you know next to the parking lot also. Well, I think uh, if there's an objection, you know what? And I'll refer to uh, Mr. Gaines. I thought at one time, didn't we have to go over into Neil's old parking lot over in there and, and secure that, uh, you know, because of the objection from the church? But that's been that's been some years back. That was many years back. Yeah. And then we did Harvest Festival for the chamber. Okay. And at that time, we actually had it at, right at the uh, right stage. The, and they were fine with it. Beer, but of course, we beer. have a different pastor now, so we do need to figure out whether or not. Okay, that was and my I, only concern. And then the, yes. and then the uh, fencing, which would have to be double fenced. Uh, double fenced and, <coughs> and the chamber has agreed to give us their fencing that, um, that we could use for that purpose. There used to be a lot of that around here somewhere. Yeah, yeah we have so, 120 of them. Can we uh, go over our kitchen to a Go ahead. Yeah. So, per the liquor license, since the church is in that vicinity, still have to talk to the pastor there to secure permission or if they have a board you still have to do that per the liquor license requirement yes and we did that yes. we're just waiting on the response okay so that's just part of the process that they have to sign on right off on that before we can sign off and i know that you know it's going to come to you for approval have you seen any kind of plans or maps or or i saw the same thing that you did yeah. uh, we were a 
aware of it about the same time that the commission was. So one of the things that we want to do, you know, I, I'm pretty concerned about how many people attend, right? And so really the plan is it's not about how many people we get to attend, it's about how much money we can raise. And so what I'm going to do is leverage my, you know, my network It's a party really for me, Ken, and it's going to be free. It's hopefully a, it's going to come. They're going to partake. I hope you guys all show up, grab a beer, make a small donation. We're going to take suggested donations. So we'll provide enticements or encouragements to people to make that donation. Sure, this is like the last time that that happened. I, I want to say it was for Rocket Football. Had a yeah, had a beer had a, yeah. had a beer garden maybe four or five years ago at yeah. the Common. Um, in a fenced-in area, it, it seemed like it went off without a hitch. Um, and, and I would be in favor of allowing you to do that as long as all your I's are dotted and T's are crossed and the police chief is happy with your plan and all that good stuff. Appreciate it. And, uh, again, it's not about how many people we get to show up because I think that uh, we can leverage um, fundraising in a different way. But it'll be a fun event. It'll be great for people to come out and just enjoy the stuff. Yeah, I think it'd be a, a great event for the community based on our conversation. I think it would we're try to keep well. it low key. We're not going to really you know, promote the fact that you know come on out. We're going to give them you know little carrots and little links so that you know, we can collect five to ten dollars. I think it could be this year. You think it's red by the weekend? So. I know. I, know. Um, I think it would be appreciated by that. But it closes on Sunday, you know, so and our, our event is Sunday. So I think it'd be important to know from the community, just have a follow up with everybody and so we can announce how much you're able to raise from the event. I think that'd be really important. But Absolutely. We're excited. It's, uh, you know what, it's kind of like what we did with our business. Um, it's a start off, but we'll, we'll see where it goes. So. Did, did you have any questions or comments or concerns? I would like to, Rick, I would like to sit down with you and, and just have a conversation so we understand exactly what's going on. Absolutely. If you could give us a call tomorrow Absolutely. or sometime. And Absolutely. We'll just sit down and go over it so we understand exactly what it is. So appreciate that. I can come down to the uh, to the station tomorrow. Sure. That would probably be the... Yep, that'd be great. Thank you. Maybe... Uh, I would move to approve the line of race event as presented and authorize the acting chief of police to sign uh, the special liquor license application. Thank you. Is there support? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Swan? Yes. Tennyson? Yes. Tommy? Yes. Money? Yes. Let's wait until someone can box. Thank you. <coughs> okay, moving on to the Smackers Ambulance Board. Yeah, I'm not Brian Scribner. Sorry, he's uh, at the Niles City event. He was detained. So. Uh, my name is Josh Kane. I'm an operations manager at Southwestern Michigan Community Ambulance Service. Um, I've actually been at Smackers for. You, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Would you mind going? Um, I can, but I got to. Oh, you have a. Yeah. That's fine. I can be loud. Okay. Is this. Can you help me sit down? No. So, um, my name is Josh Kay. Like I said, I'm not operations manager at Smackus. Um, we are coming to you today. It is, uh, we're going to renew our, our status of renewal. Um, it's been a five year renewal. And this year, um, we are asking for an increase in our status. So, basically, what we want everybody to know, our communities to know, is that Smackus is not in financial shape. Smackus is actually in probably the best financial shape it's been in a long time. Um, we've, we've worked hard to work with our building company, work with our teams, work with our hospitals to really make sure that we provide this community with a very financially stable ambulance service. Um, and we've basically gone 25 years um, without an, an increase in our assessment. 
it's been twenty dollars for the last twenty five years, and that's a year per parcel. The only thing we changed was I think last year or five years ago we incorporated uh, abandoned parcels in there, so all the parcels were included where it wasn't before. Um, so the reason we're coming to you guys is because our industry is, is in a crisis right now, um, a staffing crisis. I think a lot of people across the country is having a staffing crisis. Um, and you know, one of the reasons for the staffing crisis is, is there's, it's just uh, a shortage of, of EMS personnel, EMTs and paramedics um, across the country. Um, Michigan's not exempt from that. Um, Angela Madden, who is our uh, director of Michigan Association of Ambulance Services, actually put out a notice last week that the recruit pool is actually almost at zero right now for, for EMPs and paramedics in the state of Michigan. So there was a thousand medic shortfall last year. They predict a 30% attrition rate over the next few years. And there's only about, this is 300, but I, th I think that update numbers are about 175 people in the state that are actually in classes to become paramedics. So to become paramedic takes about two years and about three to four months of internship, so two and a half years of your life. And then when you come to Smackets, we can only pay a $12.56 an hour to start. So that is your, you're the professional that comes to your house and basically you save your life. They're getting paid $12.56 an hour to start. Um, so, and it's happening across the nation. Um, everybody, everybody is a shortage right now about the paramedics and the ENTs. And if we look at our wage comparison, so the first on the very left hand side is actually our wages. Our paramedics come in, they start at twelve dollars fifty nine cents an hour after their class or after their schooling. And our top out is eighteen dollars and three cents an hour. So that's I have been in EMS almost thirty years. That's where I left when I before I became operations manager. I was at like seventeen dollars an hour. So Medic One, which is just north of us, and then Bebums, which is Van Buren EMS, which is up in Van Buren area, um, they're obviously much higher. Medics is 378 or 1378, and Bebums is at $17.14 to start. And their, their cap wages are 25. So we're, we're very far behind um, in our wages. Um, and that's the main reason we're, we're wanting to increase this. Um, and the other reasons are we have an agent fleet <coughs> Our, our fuel costs were 65,000 last year. They're 130 to 140,000 this year. That's just for fuel in the ambulances. Um, we're also competing for people across the state of Michigan because the shortage is, is so widespread now that this pool of people to attract these people, MedStar, which is over by Detroit, is starting EMTs at $24 an hour, and they're providing all of their training and they're having, giving them a 40 hour work week and work into their schedule. We have people that are, are, are sending out $3,000 sign up bonuses. There was actually a company up in Northern Michigan that offered a $15,000 signing bonus for a paramedic and they never got anybody. No, no one even applied. Um, and I've got, on, on the right hand side, you can't really see it very well, but it's 19.55 to $24 per hour for PMTs, 24 to $30 an hour for paramedics. So we've worked, like I said, we've worked really hard to improve our billing processes. We've worked with the communities. We just want to continue to provide this service that we, you guys are used to, the community is used to. Um, we've also, through the last, you know, however many years, 10 years or so, we've tried not to increase the funding because we know how we know how it is. I mean, no one wants to pay more taxes. I sympathize. I just bought a house in Buchanan City. <laughs> I know how your taxes are. Um, but I don't want to do that to anybody. But we just are at the point where it's really at a crisis that we cannot go any further and attract the individuals that we need to attract without some, without an assessment, without increasing assessment. Um, and we basically, what we're doing, just a little explanation of how we do this. 2021, we built five dollars or five million one hundred fifty-five thousand three hundred fifty-nine dollars. So, if we collected that much, we wouldn't have an issue. We wouldn't be here right now. Unfortunately, 
we only collect about 45% of that. And that is because it's contractual write-offs with Medicare, Medicaid, CMS, all the insurance companies. That's all you're going to get. So we basically only collected about $2.2 million of that money. Now, there is, uh, you know, people out there say, well, just raise your rates. Well, we can raise our rates to a million dollars a patient, and we're still only going to get so much from insurance companies. We can't change that. So unfortunately, we cannot go out and raise our rates to, to earn more money. So this is really the only way that we can fund our, our service. Um, so our expenses were 2.7 million last year, 2021. Our revenue was only 2.3 million. And the assessment that we get, the current assessment that we get, put us at about 2.8 million. So that's only about $100,000 difference. That's, it's a razor thin line you know and we did our best to try to keep those expenses down and you know basically when you pay 84% to your people because you have to have good people to their 16% is other expenses that's fuel that's you know supplies we all know the supplies are supply chain issues you know I was paying six dollars a box for gloves I'm now paying almost twenty dollars a box for gloves so I mean it just it just you know it compounds so so basically, we just wanted to say, you know, we are your community provider. We want to continue to be your community provider. Every dime that we get goes into, you know, the quality of life in our communities. And we've been in the community since 1976. So our ask is, it's a tiered ask. So in the first year, you would go from $20 to $30. And then every subsequent year after that, it goes up $5. To a cap of fifty dollars at the end of five years, <coughs> and I know that there is some people will say we're asking for a ton of money, but as of right now, you pay a dollar sixty a month for ambulance service. After the five years is up, you'll pay a little over four dollars a month for ambulance service. So yeah, it is a big increase um, if you look at it percentage wise, but if you look at it, it it's it's as cheap as a cup of coffee sure that when you call 911, there's an ambulance that's going to show up at your door for trained professionals and, and good equipment and an ambulance that can get there. So, and you guys, I don't have anything else if you guys got questions. Or... Yeah, a few questions for us. I've been talking to some of our neighboring municipals that you've already had some conversations with. Yeah. Um, so, I, I guess my first question. to their municipalities over the past several years asking for percentage increases over those years. Okay. Um, I think they I think they vary from anywhere between three to five percent, as high as seven percent a year that they've gone to them over the past twenty some years. So basically. do they not use the same funding mechanism in terms of price per parcel to fund themselves? I honestly I don't the board ambulance services really that's about what we collect it's between 45 and 46 percent that's that's 46 47 percent is really good uh, sorry Evo, sorry Evo, the other one is actually owned by the hospital it's owned by Bronson hospital okay. but they do receive a, a one and a half million dollar um, assessment every year from their uh, to provide that this one may be more for hazard sorry I just want to make sure we're making good decisions on What's, what's the difference between a special assessment and this being a millage proposal? So a special assessment is similar to a tax, but it's different in the way that it is spread out. Um, the tax applies to your taxable value of your property, whereas the special assessment is generally on a per parcel basis and is defined, like, for instance, our millage, our general operating millages, as it sounds, we can spend it on general expenditures, whereas in this instance, this is a special millage with a special dedicated purpose for those funds per parcel that are collected to be spent just solely on this spending service. So when I look at it from a per parcel standpoint, I think about our neighbors, not necessarily as much of an impact on Buchanan, but I know this came up in your Bertrand and Niles Township conversations on
just think about, well, how equitable is the way we enforce the collection? Um, which caused me to think about, well, who's the number one user of the service? And I gotta imagine, since I haven't seen the call rates or anything, that it's gotta be Niles by a, a mile because of their pure their population base. I mean, and are we paying to subsidize Niles when they're the primary user of the service? I would have to, I would look at the numbers, but I would honestly say, Niles is probably 24%. You guys are probably 18%, 17, 18%. And if we look at it, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, so don't quote me on those. But last time I looked at it, Niles City was not terribly far behind you guys. So that's an interesting question then, right? They have, they have tripled the amount of people, maybe quadrupled, but we're, we're using that level of the service. I, like I said, I'd have to really look but I anticipate I don't have those exact numbers, but it's, I'd say you're probably maybe 10% behind them. And you know, as far as, it costs, it costs more money for us to cover farmland because we don't run calls on farmland. Right. So it, it just costs more money for us to, to provide that, you know, the cost of revenues for that. Well, Versus same thing goes to in the industrial areas. I would imagine right. industrial communities use it disproportionately. Same, but like I said, like I said, the farmers. And, and I, you know, we understand. And when we went through, we did this the parcel change. I wasn't here for that. Sure. I don't know, you know, what that was about. Um, but we did look into trying to put parcel cap on it, so these people that had multiple parcels weren't weren't impacted more than. But our lawyer, the legal community, team basically said it's not possible. Yeah. So it has to be all or nothing. Um, but yeah, we get we completely understand where they're coming. Work with them to do whatever we could to help them with that. Uh, I, got, I have a couple other ones, but kind of you can kind of see where my head's at right now. I'm having a hard time making sure we're getting the best value for the systems we can. And, and sorry, your, your boss isn't here to answer some of these, yeah. but it doesn't seem proportional for what we're paying. I think you guys need a raise. There's no question there. Is it more than double what you're getting now over the next four years? Because you know, we're having a lot of citizen response on it. make more sense as a ballot proposal to just show is it not covered by that to allow people to vote on it since there's so much coming down at them right now? So I, I'm not sure that that's something we could do. I mean, independently, we would have to form a separate authority in sure. order to do it that way. So I understand okay. that if we were going to be the ones behind that. And then maybe since my peers, as far as I know, they haven't had conversations with Niles or Bertrand yet, but if you could kind of give some recap on how those meetings Well, it's, it, it was not unanimous. Um, we met resistance basically with two individuals on their each board. Okay. And both of those individuals own multiple parcels. Okay. The, the rest of the board was, I think, was in our favor. Okay. But, but it's like I said, we met resistance because of the it impacts them. Sure. You know, and I get that. Like I said, I completely understand that aspect. Like I said, we tried to mitigate that somehow, but we just we couldn't. And like I said, it, it cost more for us to cover those parcels because most of those parcels are all farmland, you know, and it just costs more money to do that. But I understand that. But like I said, if the majority, and I think majority of the individuals on both those boards were in favor of it, other than the couple that had multiple parcels. Commissioner Slim has brought up a couple of questions. Um, if in fact, if you could get those answers for us and bring them back to us, would that be uh, too much of a situation to ask? What, what answers would you like? Well, um, the, the percentages, percentages and, and yeah, yeah those good. kind of things. Just, yeah, that's the, that's just for uh, quite possible clarity and to see where you know the other uh, communities are at. Yeah, I don't, um, but we're not asking, 
we're asking for the same amount from everybody as far as the tax funding goes. So it's not like we're going to ask you guys or not city from Walmart, they're asking for you guys or you guys are working for them. It's the same across the board. And I guess as far as call volume goes, it's the call volume has always been what it's been. I guess I'm not really 100% sure. But has it always been? I guess, I'm not sure how you answer that. Honestly, I mean, the number yeah. of individuals in that community, I'm not sure like how much they're using, shouldn't they proportionately pay for the service more? In my, that's where I'm going from. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I understand the question. I'm just putting myself in this shoes trying to figure out how you would answer that. I, 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 I don't, I mean, I mean we can only look at it from a percentage point, but I mean, that, I don't know if that really means you're not getting your money's worth. Right. Right. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's kind of where my head goes right away is to like the postal service. Every time there's a, a raise in the price of stamps, people have a conniption. But you figure out how to get a letter from here to California for a dollar, and I'd love to know how you can do that. So I guess that's an elective cost, though. I don't. Have, if I don't want to mail a letter, I send an email. Well, the first time that you need an ambulance at two o'clock in the morning, which I've had at my house, and if I hadn't, it could have been disastrous. Um, I'd be more than happy to pay more than fifty dollars to get that ambulance to my house. So I, I'm not I think disagreeing with that. I'm just trying to justify more than doubling the rate. Well, I, and I'm just. I mean, if you look, when was the last time you raised rates? Twenty-five years. It was over twenty-five years ago. I mean, we we really did try to do everything we could to mitigate this, and we're just now we're faced with this the staffing crisis and like. Right now, four of my people could retire. I'm down a quarter of my people at that point, you know, and I lost someone today that left. And I don't have, I, I can't go out to our, 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 our bank of people and say, yeah, I'll pay you $20 an hour to come here. It's cheap. You know, and that's, that's the biggest problem is I just can't recruit and retain. My team has worked, you know, through this pandemic, I mean, they have gone above and beyond. They've, they've stayed there and they've put their community you know, up front and they're tired, you know, they're tired. And they did that for $15 an hour, you know, $14 an hour. Do you have a contingency plan for what happens when you don't have any EMT? I mean, where do you draw from? Where do you, do you... We don't. We go, <coughs> we would have to reduce resources if we don't have anybody. You know, I'm already at the point where I'm running basic license work. It's, I've been doing the schedule, I've been operation manager about four years of doing the schedule, and that schedule, like one little thing could ruin a month of those schedules. And like, I don't have anything to fall back you know, I've been trying, and we've been you know, going over the state lines, we've been going as far as we can to try to recruit people and get people, and it just, it's not out there. It's just not there. You know, anybody owns a business right now knows that it's just there. Are just very worried that at some point we're going to have to reduce our resources because there's just nobody out there to do this. You know, and we don't want to do that. So maybe I should clarify. I, mean, I think you need to raise right. it. Well, I think you guys. So I'm trying to, with the data you've given us, I'm really having a hard time understanding how you're coming up with more than double what you're currently doing. That, that's all. If well, I had some, and you gave us the 10,000 foot view, and I got an answer to. Yeah. Twelve hundred households. Well, I don't remember why we added well, another fifty dollars to the tax. Code. Did Brian? Did Brian send the budget over? Budget over? Yeah. I saw cost of labor is eighty-four percent. That doesn't tell me if you do. No, you, you sent me your hourly rate, but I don't know if you guys get bonuses. I don't know what your fringe benefit cost is. I'm not trying to get just two hundred of the weeds, no. but those are the well, yeah, those are the questions your partner municipalities have wondered as well, and we're all out here wondering it. I guess. Yeah, and that's something that I, I could talk to Brian. Sure that we provide. Um, I honestly thought you made that's fair for you guys to look at. But yeah, I mean, I understand exactly where you guys come from. I get that. You know, we are asking for almost double or over double, you know, than what it was, and that is going to provide us with about another eight hundred thousand dollars a year. Absolutely essential. Yeah. There's no question. I mean, absolutely no question. How many parcels are we talking about? I don't know how many parcels you guys have. I'm talking totally what you guys are going to raise the rates on. I, I'm not going to take a guess, Cameron. I don't. I honestly don't know. Um, I, 
know Bertrand has 1,600 parcels. The Niles Township said they have 2,700 parcels. I don't know what you guys have and what McKinney Township has. Um, but I, I know right now, with our $20, I guess it's, it's probably about 20,000 parcels because our $20 gets us about four hundred and or about five hundred thousand dollars So twenty-five thousand parcels is what I would guess on that. Answer all my questions. You guys have any questions? Just so much to see that some of the answers to your percentage question but before we Yeah we can certainly to reports by departments, committees, and boards. Uh, I believe Richard Martin is here from the Tree Friend. Yep, it's Brian Murphy and Richard Martin. Um, if a tree could fall down 
damage your home or cause some personal damage to individuals. So uh, this inventory has identified 60 trees that are in severe need of, of either removal or maintenance. Um, I talked to Mike Baker before this meeting to inform me that they're already taking down some trees. We have to make sure that those trees that he's taking down are ones that were, are, were identified in this inventory. We're pretty sure they are. They're either dead or you know, the, the homeowner is complaining about their falling on their home. Um, but we need, a, we need a plan is what Davey has provided us with the beginnings of a plan. Um, we're going to get you all a copy of this so you can read it. It's 14 pages, but most of its appendices, the real meat's in the first five pages of the report. Um, we as a, a committee, the Tree Friends Committee, have um, recently been put under the auspices of the Planning Commission of the city. So we want to coordinate our efforts in planning with the, uh, with the, with the Planning Commission of the city. To that end, uh, we have embarked recently as, a, again, a volunteer committee to develop an uh, annual operating plan, which is allied with a five-year plan. There's four areas of our plan. One is maintenance, one is planting, one is governance. It's how are we governed in relationship to you, to the planning commission. And the third is fundraising and volunteer recruitment. Because we want to build an army of people that are out there helping uh, maintain the trees in our town. But there's only a certain amount of height that you can have go up in a tree if you're a volunteer. Anything they can do has to be from the ground. We're going to have to work in concert with uh, the Department of Public Works to make sure that we're coordinating efforts and identifying and using this inventory. At this point, I want to turn it to Richard, who's going to show you what this inventory can do. Now, we could spend hours doing that, but Richard's committed. He's going to try to do this in just a few minutes, right, Richard? Okay. First of all, I just wanted to mention uh, <clears throat> the water tank that you mentioned. That didn't cost the city anything. That was loaned to us by Fernwood. Uh, one thing that we have discovered in uh, creating an inventory is that it's got to be updated continuously. Um, we talked to Mike tonight, and he, Mike Baker, and he told us about some trees that he's already removed. AEP removes trees every year, and the city plants trees, and we plant trees. So we, we've got to work out a, a thing where we can get monthly reports so that we can keep this up to date. Okay, I just, just wanted to mention that. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, I should also mention that we've had this for 10 days, maybe 12 days, something like that. I spent a couple days working on it and trying to figure out how to present something to you. Uh, I may be able to answer your questions and I may not. First of all, uh, if you were to log on to BuchananMI.TreeKeeperSoftware.com, that will bring you up to the screen that we see right here. Uh, you'd be logged on as a guest. Okay, so for the people in the, the uh, tree friends, we've assigned some usernames and passwords. They can get deeper into what uh, can be seen. And I'm going to hopefully be able to demonstrate that. Uh, first of all, this is a map that has all of the tree sites in the city of Buchanan. And, uh, I asked Richard Murphy, but I want to ask while there's more people here. This lower part down here around the industrial park, is that all in the city office? Yes. There's no trees out there. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm logged in as guest, and I can select a tree. I'm just going to pick a tree here. Uh, I went all by itself out here on Smith Street. And I click on that tree and it opens this little box over on the right hand side. It tells me it's a sugar maple. Uh, site ID is eight or nine five five. That's just the, the site as uh, on the database. It's not an address or anything like that. Then we've got DBH. Uh, DBH is uh, a commonly used term is diameter at breast height, four and a half foot off the ground. That's where you measure trees because a lot of them have a real fluted base and uh, it makes it difficult to measure. Um, so 
I picked a tree and it tells me it's a sugar beet. Now over here, we've got a little icon that looks like an eye, uh, an E-Y-E eye. It tells you you can see more. And here's more of what is brought up on that site. It's on West Smith, Smith Street. Um, and then if I go back here, it tells us it's a sugar maple and what the diameter at breast height is. Um, also, this database ties in with Google Maps. And the top picture is an aerial view of the tree in question. And then the picture down below is a street view of the tree in question. Uh, I got to tell you, though, that tying into Google Maps isn't the most accurate. Uh, I looked at my house today, and I've got a big, a huge um, willow tree that hasn't been there in many years, but it still comes up as a picture <laughs> on my site. So you just have to take that with a grain of salt. Uh, one of the things that you can do if, uh, I'll be able to do it for more than one tree as I log in. But if I click on a tree right now, based on Based on that one tree, here's the money that we are saving each year. Uh, total yearly eco benefits for forty dollars and forty-two cents. The water benefits seven dollars eighty cents. When we had our major planting last year, it was uh, because of a group named Relief Michigan, which uh, is trying to reduce runoff into the St. Joe River. And one of the ways you do that is by planting trees because the roots hold the soil. Uh, so they helped us plant 48 trees to try to get rid of some of that runoff. Um, you can see greenhouse gas benefits. It tells you how much CO2 has been sequestered in the tree and how much has been avoided. Um, I have to think that that avoided is uh, what, what the leaves gather from the atmosphere. And then air quality benefits, uh, one pound of, of material, uh, particulate matter uh, is, is not uh, hitting the ground. Water benefits, let's see, 287.91 gallons have been saved energy benefits. Uh, trees provide shade so they cool, so you don't, and they also stop the wind so you don't have to cool your house so much or heat it so much. That's $13.43. And property benefits, uh, $16. It's known that having trees on your property will raise property values. So I'm assuming that's what that $16 is. And that's just one tree. That's just one tree. Yes. We have 1,589 trees that were identified in the inventory. And I'm going to log into the database now. Right over here, the log in. Yeah. Should populate it, Richard. Just hit that key. Hit that key to populate it. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. All right. He had me save my password. Log in. So there's two ways. The public can see this, and we'd like the city to have it on the website. But then for the DPW and for our purposes, we have the login, which allows us to run reports, identify trees, and also then. Um, Keep it up to date. I was going to say, is this updatable? Is this oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We have to update it. Yeah, if we don't update it, we're going to waste the investment. Yeah, it won't be any good to us at all if we don't update it. That's, that's a, us is the biggest point that we want to make tonight with you and with the DPW is that we've got to come up with a way to work together to keep this thing updated. Trees Maybe. that come down, trees that are planted, identifying bald spots. Like Richard said, the industrial park is a bald spot. We have other bald spots. The, the, the ar arborist that did this inventory said that we have 57 tree mi trees per mile, which is considered fairly low stock for Michigan communities. In order for us to have a higher stock amount of trees, we need to more aggressively plant, knowing that we get about, uh, we get 2% attrition of trees per year just from natural causes. So that's 30 trees a year just by natural attrition. If we take out trees, we need to be planting more trees. We need to plant. We need to work closely together with the with the DPW. Okay, okay, so we've got all these trees uh, represented by the green dots. And if 
I go to the search and I can write the So this brings up uh, select quick filters. You know, if I click on this, I've got high risk prune. And all of a sudden it tells me that there are 16 trees in the city of Buchanan that are in need of high risk pruning. And down here at the very bottom on the right hand side, the number's pretty small on the screen, but it says 16 total. And if I click on the report window down here, These are those 16 trees. Here's where they are located. Um, and here's the name of each of those trees. There's the diameter and the condition of the trees. Can I, can I say what they, how they define high risk prune? The 16 trees are identified as in need of pruning and presenting a high risk to the public. In order to mitigate some of the risk presented by these trees, it is recommended to remove all dead, dying, decayed, diseased, broken, or otherwise damaged limbs four inches or greater. They say the only way to have a, a, a no-risk tree canopy is to have no trees. <laughs> when, you have, just, when you have trees, you have risk. So the purpose of the inventory is to mitigate risk. This is these 16 trees, and then there are 43 trees which are identified as need, in need of removal because they're high risk for those same reasons that I mentioned before. Now, close this and come back here. And I can zoom in and zoom out to make it a little more usable for me. Uh, I don't believe, oh, I do have some trees selected. I've got those uh, high risk prune trees selected. So I'm going to go back to search and I'm going to select high risk removals. And it tells me that we have 43 trees that should be removed. <laughs> That's a lot of trees. I think we only have 1,500 and something to begin with. Uh, once again, I'll click on this. Uh, window and it tells me which trees are in need of removal. And the condition of those trees and you can see that there's a bunch of fours and here's the dead one. Um, I scroll down. That's a awesome tool. Okay, uh, close this. And we can have a species breakdown of all the trees we have in the city. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not there yet. Uh, train slash prune. You can see that we've got 203 trees total. They're all in yellow up there, or a yellow circle around the green, the green bowl. Um, we've got 203 trees that are very young and in need of pruning. They might have a branch that's going out here, and if you leave that for 10 years, that's just going to become something that falls off, so we'll have somebody prune that. We have uh, a volunteer now who we have purchased a pair of loppers for, and we're going to be giving him uh, a list of trees to prune, and he's going to do that for us as a volunteer. And that's Lane Martin. If any, I don't know if anybody knows him. He's my son. We've well, also had Lane to head, uh, spearhead the creation of core, so it's not just Lane. Yeah. We have others that are identified to do that. I was going to say, does Lane know that? Does <laughs> <laughs> Lane know that his summer vacation is every day? <laughs> no, it, it, it was very fortuitous. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. So I've done my quick filters. Uh, and I went through um, report filter right here. They've got some standard reports. And I was able to cre create one with sample tree removal. I have. Uh, modified the list of trees that we had, and I just put four in there. I, I can find them, and I'll change it after tonight. But I have uh, designated those four. <coughs> and there's those four trees right there. So we're able to pinpoint what areas we need to work on. Rich, does, does this include, like, some of those old trees that are out at Folk Ridge Cemetery that just have a probably not um, because they, they, there's a big problem out in, in that area. Yeah. You know, you I mean, you go out into the cemetery and there's some old trees there, and you know the contract that we signed was for street trees. 
these are uh, trees in the city right of way or that hang over the road. Um, so we had to draw a line somewhere. Right. It's cost them. Right. Um, they started out doing parks, <laughs> and we didn't want parks, but they did three or four of the parks before we could stop them. But it didn't <laughs> matter because we still came in under the number of trees that they estimated that we would have. Well, we so, can we can add trees, and yes. it's just a, it's it's human power. Well, yeah, I you know, and and Mike knows this. I mean, you know, for any of us that walk the cemetery, I mean, you know, there's a lot of those trees, and and it's and it's a big problem for for that cemetery crew on certain days. You know, I mean, you get a storm coming through there, a few of the next day, you got a problem. So I was just wondering because there are a lot of them that are that are broke, high, high, you know, very high up, and and I don't even think. Mike's got the equipment to be able to go in there and take care of those trees. They, so. they recommend uh, ongoing evaluation of the of the inventory in terms of uh, you're just having people drive the street slowly, you know, one driver, one observing, to just to do that. Also, to uh, uh, after a major storm, event, it's to really <coughs> in the city to see what kind of damage has been done. It's a lot of work. We know these guys are got so much on their plate. Um, we just want to help to develop a plan with them and work closely so that we can you know, make sure that we're you know, mitigating risk, also improving the canopy because we know all the economic benefits. Um, Richard talked about diversity. We have 60% uh, of our trees are maple. So if a maple blight were to come through, we would be, it would be a disaster. So we need to improve the diversity of our canopy. Um, and we really, we as the volunteer group that is assigned to this task, we need to really ramp up our maintenance plan in terms of, like Richard said, the, the pruning and watering. Um, we love it. I think there's a buzz in the town about trees. There's a, the kids at the middle school want to have like a junior tree keepers group. Um, we just planted a bunch of trees at the auto school. We've got, uh, you know, there's, there's, if you haven't noticed it, we have, but maybe we have confirmation bias, you know, because it's the work we love. Um, in mentioning the schools, last year we had a major planting at the middle school, and there were 48 trees planted. We had 109 volunteers that day, and a number of them came from the middle school. And then uh, Mr. Oh, Ryan Fronsack. Fronsack, yes. Um, he told me that they do want to form a club, and uh, I've talked with him a couple of times about it, but we'd like to offer them some benefits too. We want to hold classes on tree identification for them. And right now they are watering the trees. I took a 55 gallon drum over to the middle school. They put it up on a stand, you got a spigot on the bottom and a place to put water at the top. And I took a dozen milk jugs over to a gallon milk jug. And they use those to water the trees. And I drove by there last week, and I was just amazed at, at how nice the trees looked. Uh, they're, they're doing a good job. At the auto school, Beth Murphy donated uh, to the Tree Friends uh, watering cans for each classroom. Color-coded the cans with trees. So classrooms are adopting those trees. It's an amazing thing. The kids love the trees. This is what we want to do. We want to create tree advocates, people that love trees. We know trees are a pain to maintain, to break. Um, but the benefits of trees far outweigh those downsides. And um, this is a tree city. We need to keep it as such. So this report you're looking at here, I, I really can't see it very well from back there. I can't see it from here. Uh, I learned how to create that report in Report Builder. Um, and with a little more experience, I think I'll be able to drill down into any of the attributes of the trees. Or um, We actually created work orders for those trees. Uh, they have them removed. So. We're going to be able to use this. And, and I talked with Mike before the meeting, um, but I'll just mention it again. I had asked him to, he, he was telling me, we've already removed some trees that have been in your inventory. And I said, could we get a monthly report of what you have <coughs> done with trees? And he has agreed to do that. So, he opened up one of our veterans' banners today. Uh, <laughs> and and if, if we get the information from him, then we can update the inventory. Another point that we haven't mentioned is that this is going to become a layer. Uh, Scott Dessenberg is in it, was involved in our training uh, the other day, right? <laughs> and uh, you were there. It was, you know, and you're going to layer this in with all your other mandates or something, right? We're going to try. We're going to try. So. The idea is we want to integrate this thing into the overall plan. That's it. We just want to help. Um, 
two grades old. They wanted uh, the uh, relief company that uh, donated all the trees. They want. Um, oh shoot, it's lost the train. <laughs> that happens when you get up here and just BS, I guess. <laughs> um, but <laughs> um, we did plant a lot of trees. We're getting them watered, and we're working with the city. And we're the city, the city is working. We're developing with us. a budget. We, we're going to develop a budget so that we know how much we expect to spend each year on volunteer recruitment, training, tree planting, maintenance. It's going to take us this year to populate the plan. We've got a format for the plan that the, our committee has reviewed. We're going to populate it as we operate this year, and we're going to really start understanding exactly how much we need to spend, um, what our inflows are, what our outflows are. And uh, I'm going to talk to Heather about that, and we're going to be in communication with the city this coming year. And when we have that plan put together, we, we <coughs> ask the city for an annual budget uh, for tree planting and tree maintenance. Uh, we also have requested uh, the Michigan Gateway Community Foundation. Uh, we we haven't turned it in yet. We've got to talk to Mike Rowland about it, uh, about getting thirty-five hundred dollars a year from them just for tree planting. So that's where we're at. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. Thank you very much. Community Development Director report from Mr. Rich Murphy. Mayor, Commissioners, members of the public. I just want to commend uh, Richard and Brian and all the Canon Tree friends for your excellent work. And I know you were tenacious on getting this grant. It took a couple of times to get it, but look what it did. It allowed us to have an informed conversation about the, the economic benefits, the costs, and the reason why, as an economic developer, I see trees as essential. Keep up the good work and excellent job on the tree plantings. And I think you engaged uh, Buchanan and certainly uh, Bomb Bay. A lot of people that are uh, rooting for you and have the same numbers. So thanks Thank for advancing that discussion. Um, commissioners, I'm here today uh, a couple items. Uh, first is um, to uh, pitch to you what I see as an important economic development opportunity for Buchanan. Um, it is a public art project um, that I, I've been talking to you off and on for several months. I think the seed for this planted project was planted back on that uh, very special evening in the Buchanan Common, uh, the world's biggest watch party for Olympian Hannah Roberts when she brought home the silver medal from Tokyo. And if you were there that night, you know uh, it really uh, put that energy in a bottle special and uh, that energy is community pride but it, it's also uh, economic development and uh, potential job creation and business development um, and it's community and it's, it's a big dose of community pride um, so uh, since then uh, I've had discussions with some business owners and some uh, community advocates about a concept to um, do some public art uh, depicting Hannah Roberts, the Buchanan Olympian in downtown Buchanan. Uh, I have since uh, um, received pledges of support from Honor uh, Finance, uh, from a local building owner uh, who has uh, agreed to allow us to use the wall of the existing uh, Honor Finance building, as well as uh, I am in discussions with Michigan Gateway Foundation for that to be a partner. Um, before I came to you, I wanted to make sure that Hannah and her family were uh, okay with the idea and for me moving forward. So I have been in discussions with Hannah and her family. Um, they do love, love the idea. Uh, at the same time, lots of moving parts here. We need to look at an artist, not only an artist that uh, is accomplished, but um, one that I think would fit in Buchanan's downtown and one that Hannah and her family uh, wanted to work with. So I have uh, secured all those moving pieces. And the last uh, item was to come before you to ask you for um, you to be a, a part in this project. I'm requesting uh, $5,000 towards this uh, mural. Um, it would be uh, public art, um, is economic development. Anybody that um, 
we want a beer that's doing economic development on a high level is investing in public art. And um, certainly in this case, uh, the fact that we have such a, uh, um, probably one of the most Googled and uh, searched uh, um, citizens in Buchanan's history uh, willing to work with us on this project, uh, who will uh, likely be attending, uh, be competing at another Olympics in Paris in 2024. Well, we see a really uh, cool opportunity. Um, so I'm here to request uh, uh, funding for $5,000 for this project and uh, still some moving parts. I got to work with um, a concept with the artist and a concept with Hannah. One of the things I'm excited to do is have Hannah and the artist meet each other. And um, the artist that we uh, have identified with is, is, is named Jeff Zimmerman. He's done some exciting projects uh, in the Great Lakes uh, region in Chicago. And he's really depicted figure public figures, um, athletes, um, uh, public figures who were um, uh, women, and um, done it in a special way. So I think, again, I, 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 certainly an opportunity that I see coming back in, um, in rate of return that's uh, way over and above the investment here. So with that, I, I just asking for your support of, of the partnership, um, and I will be in touch with further updates on the project. But you know, this type of project, remember it's it's kind of captured from beginning to end. So we the minute the artist starts, we capture with social media, and we get Canon uh, on the map that way. Then as we approach the Olympics, we can start to do certain campaigns that, you know, depict this uh, mural. And I, I don't know if anyone's seen, there's a mural in Los Angeles, uh, California of Hannah Roberts. Uh, it's about four stories tall across three uh, bays of a large hotel. Um, so there certainly resonates and um, just a really cool thing uh, as we approach 2024 in Paris. Uh, you know, the plan would be in public art, you always have a beginning, a middle, and a retirement. Um, so there would be a, a creation period, a design period, creation, an enjoyment period, and then a, a, a period where we would retire the art um, because we don't want it to be uh, subject to the elements and not, <coughs> not a high uh, quality um, depiction. Um, usually, you know, we can keep an eye on that, but sometimes it's three years, sometimes it's That, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah. Well, what's the total cost going to be? I have identified, lined up fifteen thousand dollars right now, um, and you know this this artist, if you Google him, he's he's the one that did the Marilyn Monroe uh, in downtown Chicago, the Andy Warhol uh, kind of multicolored. He's done uh, Ernest Hemingway. Uh, murals in, uh, in, in uh, Michigan and in Chicago. Uh, so, 15, to answer your question, 15,000 is, is our kind of <coughs> Well, I like the idea, but we are just going to have some money on this. So, have, have we reached out to any other artists to do a price comparison, see if we're in the right ballpark? You know, I have not. Um, to me, it's really more important that you get an artist who's acclaimed and recognized and, and has Midwest exposure. Um, you know, to paint that entire wall is a skill set that very few people can do. And so there's not like, it's not like you can go out and hire the cheapest guy to do this. You want to do somebody that's going to bring that economic punch. And after a long search um, and a lot of artist contacts, I've done several artists public art projects in, in uh, my former community. And uh, this this gentleman, who by the way, his mother lives in Michigan, is one of the reasons he'll do it, is because he uh, comes back to visit her and uh, he sees a Michigan connection. So you have used him before? I'm sorry? Have you used him before? Uh, he's done projects in Michigan City, yes. You have used him? He has agreed 
and so um, we'll have to. I'll have to do a contract work on that side. But like I said, there's a lot of moving parts here. I got to confirm the artist. I got to make sure Hannah is, and the artists are working together. I got to go back and reaffirm everybody's financial support. I just need to clear your conceptual financial support, and then I'll be back in touch. I, I got a lot of other things on my plate, and I just don't want to miss this opportunity to do something that I think could really put the cannon on the map. If, if we reached out to any other uh, businesses or organizations for quite possibly help with that $5,000? Uh, I have I identified three organizations. I just thought about three legged school that could be partners. It gets a little difficult when now other partners are coming in, and I I can reach out, but I don't want that to be critical to the moving forward. I mean, I'm either going to do this or not do it at this yeah. point because I, I got too uh, I got too many other things that I got on my plate. And so I just, if I don't do it soon, I'm going to lose the attention span of the artist and Anna and everybody. So it, like, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. But I, I will uh, look, seek opportunities for uh, more funding, but I don't want that to preclude and decide if that project can even move forward at this point. Right. Like, well, I was just going back to what Cameron said, you know. So there's, I know there's a couple organizations that would probably come up that could cut this $5,000 bill quite possibly in half, you know, or something like that. That's, all, that's the only thing I would say. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean. And I, you know, I mean. I hear you. To, you know, part of the thing is if you want to build this public art culture, you got to kind of do a couple of demonstration <coughs> projects that plant the seed and then uh, engage the community. Uh, you know, in my former community, we had a public art committee. Um, so they were in charge of installations and projects and rotations and fundraising and leases and things. Um, so we're trying to plant the seed. And sometimes when you plant the seed, you got to be the demonstrator. And uh, that's where I'm at. I think that's Second item I have is uh, I have a city of Buchanan downtown facade program application uh, that I brought forward to you. Um, you may remember that we, when I um, brought these uh, programs forward, I did leave uh, a discretionary um, room for discretion for the commission in certain circumstances uh, that arguably would provide community benefit. Um, the program is primarily for downtown commercial driving uh, uh, business development downtown. However, the applicants, as I have explained to them, um, they they brought this forward. They asked me, you know, is this uh, an appropriate project to bring forward for discussion? And because of this discretion, uh, I'm bringing it to you to have this discussion with you. Um, as I mentioned to the uh, the applicants, I, I said I bring things forward, but I don't vote on, on them. Um, but I do bring them forward to, to have a discussion with you uh, on what your vision is on how we're going to apply these funds to, for the future. So we have a, um, a, a application from the uh, Buchanan Area Senior Center um, for a facade grant um, in relation to their uh, what they're calling. Some room addition to the Buchanan Area Senior Center. Um, how 
total cost is uh, projected to be $160,400. Um, my understanding is some work has maybe been done, uh, but the, a lot of the work is, is going to be done uh, this summer. Um, so I, I told them that I would bring the application forward uh, for your discussion and review and see where we are. And so that's a project. I know that some representatives from the senior center are once for a retirement party. Yeah, we did. In fact, the pictures I sent with the application showed that use. But uh, that was due to the pandemic. And the reason we chose we kind of impetus to move forward with this was during the pandemic when we were under attendance restrictions and we could only have 10 people in our huge space. And we had had separate space. Many of our rooms are too small to really make a difference. And so the 10 was, you couldn't even get 10 people with social distancing in our library or, or our craft room. But this, this space is very large. It has cross ventilation on either end. There's sliders that open completely. Every bay has a window that opens. So it's gonna have fresh air flow. So when the pandemic hit and we started talking about the, what we could do to increase our capacity restrictions like that, people said, well, we talked about this, the most logical way to expand would be to enclose the patio, the covered porch. And it's going to be, when you when you come by, you'll see it's really, it looks beautiful. It, it is a separate room. And it's named after Russell Stevens, who was a longtime supporter. I'm sorry? I said it is a separate, yes, it separate is. room. It could be closed, separated, so or separated. Or separated. Yeah. They could be 10 in that room and 10 in our main room. And not only that, and so I have Sabina Vitti and the Secretary of the Board, but not only that, we can have more activities. So we have an extra space that allows us, if we have, for example, chair yoga, we can have another activity in another room. So that allows us to serve even more patrons at one time. So we are here to help out our community seniors who are rooted within our area of Buchanan. And, and help them out and have a place to be in social lives. And like Adam said, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, have a space that they can call their own. And therefore, that's why we're here asking for this. And we were voted as the number one at very well, yes. right? Yes. Yes, we were. That was the public. But it also is, you can look out the windows and you'll see the first two tribute trees that we planted at the senior center. We planted eight tribute trees, and they're beautiful, and they're beautiful new grounds. And I just, if, if you come and see it, you'll see how 
much of an addition, a beautiful addition to the space it is. It really is. I think one of the things that it will benefit the seniors that we serve, and being a 79-year-old senior, I know what services they do offer and I use them, is the fact that there's a place we're going to have that they can come and sit, whether it's snowfall, rain, heat, whatever, be comfortable. We've got three coffee pots set there, three coffee for them. They can sit in that room and be comfortable with other seniors and not feel deprived, not feel like they're using anybody, to really feel independent. And that's one of the things that I've learned in working with the board. Senior independence helps them mentally and physically do the things they need to do. And this room will be a blessing for those seniors. <clears throat> and it's fine. Is there, is there a dollar amount tied to this number? I didn't see it. Well, because their project is $160,000, that would qualify for the maximum eligibility amount of $10,000. Well, I'm looking at this, and we had an intention with the SIAP program. And if I look at the exclusions, so many of the things in the exclusions were brought up by everyone back here. You know, there's going to be there's going to be wiring, there's going to be windows, uh, floors and ceilings on the inside. This this is in the back of the building. Yeah, so, it's so it's not a true facade. We we talked about a rear facade, grant, I believe, haven't we? We have discussed putting that together. But we haven't put anything together yet. Mr. Dowdy, may I say something? Can you stand up so I can hear you? Yes, I can, sir. Uh, when you approach the building from, is it Brian Nielsen? Brian Nielsen, because Brian Nielsen, you're coming up, you will see the beautiful side of the building. So it is a facade. You can see it. And that is just not the front of the building, it's just the back side of the building. So I, I would consider it a facade. Thank you. Rich, what is the, the purpose of the, uh, the sign grant? What, uh, what are we hoping to gain from the, the primary The primary purpose outlined in paragraph one is to promote historic preservation and continued use and maintenance and control of commercial and mixed use buildings in the central business district, attended Dell property and owner, commercial tenants to rehabilitate and restore the visible exterior of existing structures in a way that match the pleasing aesthetics of our historically significant downtown. Um, so it has been a, you know, I said that at the beginning, the primary cause was that, uh, or the primary purpose was downtown. But I know, it, I anticipated um, instances like we have tonight, and I wanted to be able to defer to the will of the commission and not bring projects that you guys might have an appetite for ever for, you know, or may not. So I did put that discretionary clause, Heather and I, and I think a few commissioners uh, that I discussed it with, um, we put that discretionary clause because we um, foresaw discussions like this. I, you know, it puts us in a difficult place because we have to be the ones who say yes or no, depending on what we're thinking. Um, and I, I guess I'll be the bad guy say what I'm about to say, but <clears throat> I love the senior center. Let me just start with that. And I love the services you provide. Um, I, I think that the idea of the incentive program, uh, and I don't want to speak for the rest of them, but I'm, I'm fairly sure that we are all along the same lines of thinking, that this would be used downtown to help rehabilitate some of the old buildings that are outdated, run down, To be eligible for a downtown facade for equal loan, the building should meet all of the following criteria. The building must be used in or home for commercial purposes and located in the central business district or as authorized by us. But I, um, I 
when I think of your building, and you have a lovely building, um, I, I think it's in much better shape than a, than a lot of the other buildings and the folks who come and ask us for money. Um, that's just kind of where my head goes. <clears throat> May I add something to that? Um, we didn't always have this beautiful building that um, uh, McDonald uh, Ralph had built us. Um, and we have never received any help from the city. And the reason that we've never received any help from the city is because they've always said, well, that's taxpayers' money. And you have enough money. But most of the money that's raised for this, all of the money that's raised for this, is all coming from our seniors, uh, and I think you know how much they get paid. So it seems to me that although this may be a building that is not downtown and it's a new building, a fairly new building, from 2010, we've never asked for help. We've never received help. And I think that it would mean a lot for our seniors to know that the city supports them. And that's Rich, did you have any concerns over precedence when you thought of this project? Well, I mean, setting a precedence. It's uh, I, I I knew at some point we would have this discussion, and I just didn't want to be the one that um, made decision policy decisions <coughs> in kind of an area that is kind of a gray area in, as far as um, community benefit. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's, uh, I would be asking them well, to be approved this, what other projects outside would be considered. Um, I mean, it's, it's, this is a tough one because, you know, I, I, I did have a discussion with Adam about it, and I'm like, to me, this, no one disagrees that this senior center gives um, excellent community yes. benefit on a high level. And so to me it's worthy of bring it forward for the discussion. And that's that's my role. I bring it forward. And I did I, I you know I did let them know I don't vote. I don't vote. You know, and I don't think that's fair to, for anybody to think that you should. I, you're here to do economic development, that's what you're doing. The decision would be up to us. I understand your situation. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, You got to step up to it. The rain's getting loud. Hard to stand up. <laughs> Sweet shop, red book hardware. We did all of the, you know, they put new awnings and, and new lights and signage and the union stuff. Yeah. The union <coughs> the sweet shop, hometown nutrition. Yes. So I guess I, I want to make a few points. One, we qualify for the grant. 
we're a commercial facility. This is a facade improvement. We're using a storefront system, actually, which is the same thing that Dama Competitions is used. Our seniors have already donated a quarter of the cost. Over 40,000 have been donated by the seniors. That's not a well they can, you, we can keep going to that can you know, supply all of the funds for this project. And it is a community use. This weekend, there was a buck teens party at the senior center. Last weekend, there was a there was a senior's birthday party, I can't remember the person, but every almost every weekend there's an event at the senior center. It's it not, is the largest event. I mean yeah, it's the yeah. largest place if you can have an expanding that space. Um, so I really encourage you to consider seriously the benefits of this project to the community. Economic development is not just people shopping in stores. It's people coming to an event and then shopping to an event and going to a restaurant. Can this be in the nicest city of the USA? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean we can do that one. Yeah, we're not everyone, but everybody. <laughs> I'm going to try and move it. To I know you're going to have to acknowledge me, though, Sean, because you did this. Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> not for you. You started this. Go back to Robert's rules. Stop this. Rich should have never brought this to you without discussing it to you in private because you guys are in between a rock and a hard spot. It's not qualified. Rich knows that. No, he actually, it's not. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, now I'm going to stop you. Okay. Because actually, it, it does qualify. I mean, Rich is right. It has to meet these, these eligibility requirements or as otherwise authorized by the city commission. So really, when we dreamt up this plan, it was to fix up old buildings downtown. Or if there was some other entity that wanted to come and ask for money that was not in the downtown, that would be up to us to figure out. I mean, it's not an easy decision, and now we're, you know, if we say no, we don't like seniors, if we say yes, we're going to give money to anybody you who comes to the downtown. No, we, we, we understand. <laughs> we did we Rich reach out to them, or did they reach out to Rich? We did. Okay, good. Good to know. Okay, so, so well, now, I, now I would like to just stop the back and forth between us and you, so we can discuss so, like I said, we're between a rock and a hard space here, but I look at this right here, and several times it says historic preservation, historically significant. So what qualifies Rich as historic? What, where's the line? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm just going to go back to my other, my original premise, which was, there's a, a priority purpose with discretion. So if, you know, I kind of wish that maybe this came up earlier than on the floor, that we could have maybe, you know, had this discussion, uh, table that you have the discussion or something. But, you know, the, I think I answered that question. I mean, I, I want to get rid of the idea that we're not allowed to have tough discussions like that, because that's why we're sitting here to make hard decisions. Um, so, you know, the idea that we shouldn't be having difficult decisions or discussions because they're difficult is absurd. Um, I mean, I have to tell you that I, I don't think that it qualifies based on um, our idea of the facade program. I would, I mean, I would be willing to make a small donation to the project because we do appreciate the senior center. Um, I don't know if the rest of my commissioners would be on board with that, but to show you that we care about your facility and that we love what you're doing up there, I, I, I would rather go that route. My fear is that if we if we do this grant for you, that people are gonna come out of the woodwork all over the city asking for money. That's my fear. I mean, I, I can appreciate the creative way that we're trying to put this together. I really can. I think my reservation simply comes from the fact that to your point, we're, we're essentially setting the precedent, and, and we're allowing this to become potentially an open can of worms that anybody you said they can come to the table. And, it, it, and the hard part is, is that the way that we've discussed tonight, the way that we've presented, the way that we've had this back and forth, is clearly going to shift a certain way or the other. It's inevitable. It's, it's the way it goes, and this is the way it technically should have not been done. It's not there's any disrespect to Rich. Well, it's, not disrespect. it's great. It's good to be able to talk to you guys. Don't you think? We do appreciate that, and I think that we 
we can get in another discussion on that. I think that we don't do any kind of town halls, right, where we can have this back and forth in the dialogue with some questions. I don't disagree with you on that either. I really don't, because I think that's, to some degree, when things get moved forward a little bit faster than if we were to just always have this regimented way of doing things, right? So we can agree on that. Um, you can also clearly see how it gets out of hand, and just like any party, everybody wants to be involved, right? And we can't have that either. So, um, to that point, it really does come down to a precedence. And I think you have a valid point that you do have individuals who come there who did spend paying them economic money in the city, and then you provide a service, and I even said it to Sean earlier today, and I don't know the numbers, I simply see it from when I pass by, and it is clearly one of the most active senior centers in the area. And I don't know where all of them are at, but I know where Niles is at. They don't have anywhere near the cars in the parking lot that this senior center does. So, um, thank you for what you do for the senior center, because it's clearly changed since you have arrived. Um, based on all of our reactions, and I don't speak for them, you can clearly tell we are, we, we, this is a difficult decision for us as well. So please know that. Rich, I got a question for you here. Uh, is there anything that's more helpful in the Main Street program? Main Street is focused more on downtown. Yes, they, they do a lot more restrictions. Okay, there. I just wondered if there was an extension of some kind that uh, would help. But to, but to your point, and I think you do bring a valid point that people may not be aware of, is they do restrict in the original intent, even though there was a little bit of flexibility, was to restrict it to the central business district. To designated historical buildings. Uh, it's, it's clearly written there, and I think that the black and white, Monroe, I respect you, I really do. No, no. And we're going to come to you afterwards. Yeah, I'll come to you afterwards. Don't come to you afterwards. That's fine. And Dan, she's out of order. I understand, Dan, you are as well. So <laughs> no. Can we just have a little bit of time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, right now but and we may not like each other but for the moment for the rest of the people in the room yeah. it's okay please um okay so we failed to get a motion so we're going to move on to the community oh, i'm sorry city treasurer report city treasurer report yeah <laughs> Members of the public, I'm really pleased. Hang on, everybody, can we commit just a moment? Can we? Is yeah. everybody? I would, I would ask that we be respectful of people who are speaking, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioners, Mayor. Thank you, members of the public, other great city manager. It's my pleasure today, over thunderous applause, to introduce our new um, treasurer, Deb Perez. We're really thrilled to have her. She comes with great experience, over 10 years' experience as a treasurer of the city of Fenville. We're extremely fortunate to have her with us this evening and move forward. So I want to welcome her to our finance team and we can see you. Water Sewer Fund net position is last certified 9,897,402. General government net position 5,323,393. We will at our next meeting have a more detailed treasure report to share with the commissioner and the public. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move down to the waste.
Police Water Department update. Hey guys, long time no see. Long time no see. I'm going to get to stop quick. I might get a while. Yeah, quick. That's my time. Stop quick, stop quick. Brevity. All right. Um, so we're here to do the uh, fiscal review of last year of the wastewater treatment plant. I'm Bill Hauser, uh, wastewater treatment plant superintendent. Obviously, the big item over the last year was the start up of the new plant. Uh, we actually started it, started the plant up in June of 21, but we were actually still starting equipment going well into the fall and into the winter. Uh, during that time, we were still running the old plant in parallel, idling it and sh shutting it down while we started the new one up. But for the most part, everything is running really well. Uh, the new plant runs uh, really smooth, it's reliable. The equipment we have has been great. We've had just a few items, uh, warranty items, probably a dozen minor things that we've had to have fixed, uh, but nothing major. The only thing left that we have to have done this winter or this summer is going to be having some gears adjusted and uh, a Ferris leak that mechanical contractors have to come back up. If it's minor stuff, we're talking just small gears that we're containing. That's all scheduled within the next month. Um, the efficiency that we're seeing so far, some things that we've, uh, the plant's allowed us to do it. We've reduced one full-time operator at the plant already. We've reduced uh, weekend and holiday overtime by two-thirds so far. Uh, reduced energy by approximately $10,000, it looks like, this year. And that's with running both plants, so that's that's not going to be a good, that's probably going to get better as we move forward. Um, maintenance was down 13000 so far this year, so that was good. So that was kind of a wrap up on what happened in the plan. I did want to say thank you to the city and the commission and everybody that supported us in getting this built, giving us such a nice place to work. Um, it's it's a lot more reliable process than what we had. The old plan really was falling apart. So we, we did a good thing here and I think it's going to pay for itself in the long run. That covers the plan. Do you guys have any questions on that before I move on? Uh, we had a flow increase this fiscal year of about 20%. Uh, we're up through May about 2 million gallons. That's going to lead to about an increase of $60,000 for the year in leachate revenue. Uh, we've also heard recently from the Southeastern County Landfill that they are going to be moving forward on a flow equalization plan. That will also help us out with some efficiency issues with the plant. So we're looking forward to getting that done. It's been Something we've been working through for about four years since they started their SBR out there. So it, we did hear from Tyler on that that they're moving forward. We re-permitted the landfill. Uh, that's the only, our only permitted discharger on the system right now. We reissued a three-year permit uh, at the beginning of April. So that's what's going on with the landfill. Septage. We got a plan approval from Eagle last July. We actually got the station built in September and started receiving. October. At this point, we've done 141,700 gallons uh, with a revenue of 9,210. Um, so that's what's up with septage. We did refile for a new discharge permit. It's obviously kind of viable for how we work down there. Everything in there is quantified in what we do. Um, those permits typically last three or four years. Applications are a big deal. That was completed in March. The application ended up being 77 pages and one of the things we asked the state for based on the plant and its capabilities with digital inputs and all the pieces of equipment was reduced monitoring requirements so we will have a reduced testing schedule that could potentially save some money in man hours and lab supplies also there. Um, they sound amenable to that but until we have our new permit we'll go and see. So that is kind of the, the high points of what's happened over the last year. The big thing has really been trying to idle that old plant. One of the main reasons we had to do it was our old buildings, the basement was all full. Over the winter, we spent a lot of time and energy trying to dewater those things when it was single digits. And we kind of got good at it. I think we have a plan going forward that'll make it easier, but we spent a lot of time messing around with that. And we're still in the process of idling it. But overall, it's been a good year, I think. Um, start up a lot of times on those ditches can cause compliance issues. We had zero. Month over month, we actually improved our treatment for the old plant. And 
and that almost never happens. Every year, that's pretty helpful. Any questions on any of that? One question, one comment. So, Lambda is making a significant investment in a low utilization that I can't remember how much. If it becomes available, like if we start seeing a window, I'll pursue it anybody we can. But right now, what's going on with PFOS? If we took, we're not at the action level of PFOS yet. Right? If we took a load of something and put us at the action level, the implications could be in the millions of dollars in the city. So we're just kind of trying to walk this through until something happens. So for right now, I, I think we kind of stick with where we're at. Okay, then we're gonna go to the water department report. Good evening, commissioners, everyone. Uh, we'll start off here with a brief update. Um, you want me to read this and just kind of go through it quick? Can give us the All right. Um, we have a really good, really good source of water. Our shallow aquifer that runs pretty much everywhere in this area. Um, all of our compliance sampling has been really, really good. Um, we're well in compliance on everything, even with the addition of PFAS and asbestos to our uh, sampling schedule. Um, we couldn't be happier with the water that we're getting out of that aquifer. The issue right now with pumping is the fact that we've taken well three off the manganese content of that well. And 
and we don't have a new well with iron treatment online to go along with well five yet. Um, it's in the process. It seems to be moving down the road year to year. But we're in a slightly vulnerable position right now with pumpage. If we're to test positive on a total cow form sample with two wells in the same month, then we're going to be forced to pump well five as our main pumping well for the span of about a week, and we're not going to be providing the citizens with the quality of water that they're used to receiving. Well five runs about between 0.5 and 0.7 parts per million of iron, which is generally considered to be unacceptable for drinking water due to staining and taste issues. That's why well five has never been placed online as a main production well. Uh, we only run it once a week, piggyback with our other wells. And so, until such time as six comes online or whatever we decide to call the new well with iron treatment, we're in a slightly vulnerable position as far as pumpage is concerned. Um, and that goes along with any sort of contamination that might occur with those two main production wells with one and four. Being 40 feet deep and not confined, there's always a concern that if there was some sort of disaster on the railroad or some other contamination issue that would affect those wells, we would really be in a little tough position as far as providing our customers with the quality of water that they're used to receive. So um, we really want to emphasize that uh, it's very important to get another well online with the appropriate treatment to provide us the redundancy that we need so that we can continue to provide that great, good, safe drinking Our other horizontal or our other vertical assets are really in pretty good shape. We just received our well pump and engine reports back from Peerless Midwest. Um, all of our wells, motors, everything looks to be in really good condition. Um, our water towers, um, really good condition. The coatings are holding up well from about five years ago. Uh, next year, we'll take those out of service one at a time. Do a interior coating evaluation to see where we're at with that. But towers appear to be in really good shape. Wells, pumps, motors appear to be in really good shape. Um, as you can see here, the Achilles heel of our system is the distribution system in the older parts of the town. Um, large percentage of our distribution system is approaching 100 years old or has exceeded 100 years old with respect to the horizontal assets, those being water mains and water services. Um, the expected life expectancy of uh, ductile iron pipe or cast iron pipe as this is, is between 80 and 90 years. So large portions of our distribution system have already exceeded their expected life and are continuing to age. Um, we had a service line break on Lake Street last Sunday. Galvanized iron pipe has probably been on the ground since at least 1926. Of course, it did. that's what's going to happen in increasing frequency going forward until we replace those aging pipes, unfortunately. Um, in addition to that, we have the uh, lead copper, lead service line replacement requirements that have been placed on us in the state of Michigan. Large portions of that system that are in that 100-year-old category are also going to contain lead goosenecks in the water main connected to galvanized iron pipe. And the state has given us uh, 18 and a half years now to replace all approximately 600 of those in our distribution system. That's part of those corridor projects that are on the back side of the plan that Prime Newhoff brought to us three or four years ago. Got the interceptor out front, we've got the downtown project out front, and then subsequent to that, we start up front street, Chippewa, Cayuga, Detroit, Lake, Smith, Road. All of those portions of town that are in the oldest portions of our distribution system are going to be affected by the lead service line replacement requirement. And it's not even on the front end of what we're planning to do. So we have got to make a priority uh, of infrastructure.
infrastructure replacement. And it's got to start to avoid, I don't know what the state's going to do with us, but the clock's ticking. It started last January. We're at 18 and a half years left to replace those lead service lines. And thus far, we've done one. And that was last Sunday. So that's kind of where we're at with our department. Um, great water, great vertical assets, but our horizontal assets are an issue. It's going to be a big mountain to climb. Um, we cannot wait to start on this. It's got to be at the forefront of what we're focused on as a city, in my opinion. So, yes. Scott, if you started to put together a plan, so knowing you have 18 and a half years, mm -hmm. right? Seems like a long time, but it's, it's, it's going to move quick. It's not. Right? Have we started to look at what that the numbers look like and what the, how that fits into 18? Well, that's all part of that capital improvement right. that we're supposed to be moving on. It was brought forth by Ty Newhoff and right. uh, Andy Campbell, my Rachel. Yep. We're supposed to be able to cover that, um, but we've got to get started. Yeah. So I think to where Mark's going, we're really looking at your team to establish that plan with those teams and bring it to us so we can start taking action on it. We can, I, can, I think everyone up here wants to say, yeah, we want to replace those lead lines. We don't want to be the next Ben Harbor. Right. Um, well, so let's make a distinction real quick between us and Benton Harbor. Benton Harbor is a surface water treatment facility. Right. We're a groundwater treatment facility with very, very hard water. So our water, in essence, protects us from those lead loose leaks. Um, the chemical composition of our water means that A, it's not aggressive, and B, it actually coats the interior of pipes with calcium substance that in a lot of cases the water doesn't even really make contact with those surfaces so we're fortunate in that our source of our water protects us in a way that Benton Harbor doesn't. With surface water you have very minimal hardness. The water is by nature more aggressive because of its chemical, chemical makeup so we're in good shape there. Um, our lead and copper testing results over the years have been very good. Uh, we've not had any exceedance last round of testing was last year and everything came back. Uh, I think our highest detect on lead was less than a third of the recollection of lead. That's, so, that's it, great. So we're in good shape there. You know, um, It's just that those lines are going to continue to fail because they're made out of galvanized iron and we're mandated to get those out of the ground basically. So the well side of that conversation, is that the one that's budgeted in the upcoming project in their well? Is that the same well that we need to add that you referenced earlier? Yes. So we're, yeah. we got the well piece planked. So the good block, additional good source of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, the new well and the iron removal to treat that well and well five is part of the plan for not next year, but the following year. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. So that'll give us the redundancy that we need feel safe with our source water. I like that. Yeah. We, we just want to replace those lines. Not well, so. well, I, think to, I think to that point, I think where I was going with that is that I was curious if you had something laid out from your perspective, in your knowledge base, I don't know. So that, that you would, and it doesn't have to be concrete, I don't really expect an answer now, but I was, you, you had made a very Point to point that we need to get moving. I'm curious, like, are you looking at going, okay, do we need to do 500 a year? I know that's, I'm just putting, I'm not saying that's a concrete number, but. No, so we have, we have approximately 630. We estimate 630 levels. Okay. okay. So over the course of you know, 18 years, find out it's not that daunting a task, right? But it's just, here's, so. That is just a small component of the projects. Because like I said, take a look at the church. Right, what are their properties? 60 to 75 houses from the high school on the floor street. I don't want to be the guy that drills 60 to 75 one inch holes in a four inch water main that's been in the ground since the 1920s. That is a disaster waiting to happen. So we have to 
not only replace the services, we have to replace the water mains. They're under the streets, the sewers from the 1930s. The storm needs to be upgraded. That's the crux of the problem. Is it's just it's not just those flood service lines. It's the mains that they're attached to, and the sanitary sewer, and the storm sewer, and it's all buried under the roads. So that's where this becomes this monumental mountain that we're running into. And that's, you know, if it was just replace 40 services a year, yeah, it's going to do a number on the roads, but that's conceivable. The problem is the quality of the mains that you're going to be trying to tap into one inch water taps. Um, you know, I've heard stories on South Red Bud Trail where they replaced the water main there in the uh, 80s or early 90s that when they actually took the dirt out from around the water main, the system pressure would shoot the corpse out. The dirt was what was holding the corpse in the water. You know, if we're looking at the situation like that in those other parts of town, there's no way we can tap those things. So, I mean, that's, that's the crux of the situation that we're facing. It's, it's not just one service line we're facing. It's everything else that goes along with it. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, two other things that are on my agenda. We had the uh, question come up a lot in the last year for uh, tap fees for water and sewer. And nobody who's here could remember a time when we had tap fees or what they were. Or, and I think it's just due to the lack of construction that's taken place here prior to the last couple of years. I mean, there was kind of a 40 year hiatus on any sort of building or anything that took place in, we know. in town. <laughs> yeah, no, trust me. So, whatever. The, the process was for tap fees, um, things of that nature, and kind of fallen by the wayside. Um, but the question kept coming up because we're having such a surge in construction. What are your tap fees? What are your connection fees? You know, every other town charges these. What are yours? And, and we didn't know. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Jill found a form that I have updated in a file folder somewhere front at the city hall that had um, out of date rates for things like sprinkler meters, um, new house meter kits, um, tap fees for water, connection fees for water, tap fees for sewer and things of that nature. And so basically what I did was take that aside and update our vendor prices on meters, meter horns, radio transmitters, things of that nature, which we sell to the customers at cost. You know, we're not making a profit. If you build a house in Buchanan, we'll sell you a meter, meter horns and a radio transmitter at our cost in the shop line. But as far as the tap fees were concerned, um, I reached out to three of our neighboring communities, <coughs> being uh, Niles, Varian Springs, and the city of Richmond. And they all had various different programs, I guess, for what they charge for water taps, what they charge for sewer connection and things of that nature. And by and large, a lot of them seem to be unnecessarily complicated. Niles charges for a sewer connection based upon frontage foot of your property along the road. So if you have a very narrow property, you would pay a small amount. If you had a very wide property, you would pay a very large amount for you to make this exact same connection to the exact same sewer, which seemed kind of silly. Um, Berrien Springs had a sliding schedule for water taps, which started off relatively reasonable, and then if you got into a three or a four inch water tap, it became <coughs> almost prohibitively expensive, in my opinion, um, to connect. So I kind of aggregated all of their information, tried to make it simple so somebody like me could understand it, and um, what I came up with, uh, you can see here, want to connect to an existing water service, like <clears throat> what happened out on Sherman Parkway, they installed the water main, they ran a tap to the edge of the road, it's there. It's ready for you to hook up to. The um, fee for that would be $500. If you buy a lot that does not have an existing tap on it, or for whatever reason that existing tap is 
not sufficient. We have to dig down and install a three quarter inch or a one inch tap to water gain. That would be a thousand dollars. We don't tap anything larger than one inch in the house. We hire people to come in and do bigger taps, whether it's inch and a half up to six inches or whatever. We would have city services come down and then that would just be charged at the rate of whatever the contractor charges us to install that tap. Sewer connections, um, any sewer connection to an existing lateral or main would be $1,000. Um, the city doesn't actually own sewer laterals. Um, it is our ordinance that the city owns the main running down the center of the road and then the entire lateral is the responsibility of the home. So uh, that doesn't get the 500 1,000 split. That's a straight $1,000, which would include the cost of the inspection by city personnel for your connection. Scott, I mean, so these are comparable to other, I mean, to bridge within so. Niles. And yeah, absolutely. So the, the laterals that you have here last, our last meeting here, when we did the additional research, that seems consistent statewide. Yeah, it's, it's very not good. just. A Sewer tap fee rate schedule as presented. House board. side at the beginning of the pandemic and now we're trying to rebuild it so that we can become active once again with our wildlife protection program um, and so what you see is a list of people who would be involved with that program and it's I've reached out to everyone who's not a city employee and confirmed that they're they want to participate again um, for the city employees uh, there's been a great deal of turnover so we simply slid present position into former position. So uh, myself, obviously, I'm still here. Uh, Rich Murphy would take over for Deb. Uh, Heather, obviously, would take over for Bill Marks. Mike would take over for JT. Laird Willard with the uh, Barron County Health Department. I talked to Laird today. He agreed. Tim Wesner's on board. Craig, obviously, is still here. Um, Dick Chubb is eager to get going. So is Angel Witzel with the schools. And for those that you don't know, we go into the seventh grade classrooms normally on a, on a 
normal year, we go in and talk to the kids about aquifers, wellhead protection, source water protection, uh, one day in the spring, and the kids have a good time, and we go in and we explain how wells work, and then we build wells out of little, uh, like, root beer floats, right? So your straws the well pipe, and your ice creams, the protective barrier. Craig Miller actually brought us some yeah. oh, yeah. milkshakes. Yeah. I don't know what you're doing. Mean, that's the same thing, yeah. 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 So, um, so we go into the middle school, and Angel's our liaison there. She's a seventh grade science teacher. Uh, Mindy, obviously, is still here. Uh, Ashley Regal is graciously agreed to sit on the board as a township resident. And then, uh, great news, Kelly Hahn is back with Michigan Rural Water Association, no longer with Weiss and Vanderbrink, uh, which makes their participation in this program basically free. Uh, Weiss kind of expected their half their desires, where it's now the full, if we if we reach out for that uh, grant, the full amount of that money would come from us. So that's a good deal. We like working with Kelly. She's great at her job. And, uh, economically, it's more beneficial for us with her back in rural water. So um, those are the, our, our proposed members of the committee, and hopefully we can get that on track and have a meeting before too long and go back to our quarterly meetings and go back to <coughs> stuff with the grants like what you saw at Thrill on the Hill a couple of years ago where we had the, the goodie bags for everybody and, and uh, the models that we provided for the schools from the groundwater model and the surface water model that we were able to donate to the schools several years ago. So we're eager to get back to those types of programs. Great. Would you make a motion? This is money. I'll move to appoint the members of the Wellhead Protection Committee as presented. Thank you. Is there support? I'll support. Can we roll call, please? Money? Yes. Schlemm? Yes. Madison? Yes. Weeded? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Scott. All right, moving on to item F, Buchanan Building Authority. All right. So myself, Heather, and Rich all met last week to approve a resolution that was um, asked by Roger. We then, well, Heather then created a different resolution for um, authorizing the insurance building authority bonds. Uh, we decided not to move forward until we had the majority vote from the city commission on moving forward to sign our resolution for the building authority. Does that make sense? No. Sorry. <laughs> So we, as the building authority, were given a resolution to sign, along with mayor. We did not feel comfortable making that decision because it was about the bonds and issuance of the bonds. So then we instead created another resolution for you guys to say, we're not going to take any action until you tell us. Our resolution was that our authority will take no action until it is approved at the city commission level. So the only thing we're approving tonight is the fact that we know we're going to go out to bond, but there's, there's no dollar amount yet. It's just the fact that we're giving the city authority to pursue the bond, correct? There, so I have Andy Campbell on speed dial. He said that he was willing to answer questions like that. So if you guys will bear with me, I'll get him on the line. speaker at our city commission meeting. Um, we are at the portion of our agenda where we're discussing the bonds and there was a commission um, question. Our mayor Dennison was asking whether there is a dollar amount tied to the resolutions that are on their agenda for this evening, the ones that were put before our municipal building authority. Uh, yes, maximum of five. So it's, it's a cap of five million but does it mean that if they approve it tonight that they have to go for the full five million or it's just that's a maximum cap? They wanted to clarification on that. That's just a maximum cap. We'll issue what the city wants to in terms of uh, approving an amount at a later time. So at a, at a past meeting, I thought there was concern about when they went out to sell the bonds that we couldn't basically return the money after we had applied for it. So 
What am I missing here? Can you repeat that? I didn't get that. Um, he, this was Commissioner Swim was questioning. He said that he thought he had understood from a previous meeting that once the bonds are um, applied for, that we can't return the money. So he's he's basically inquiring if we approve the five million cap tonight. Um, are we obligated them to borrow up the, the five million, or is there some mechanism by which they could decide to have a lower amount? And what does that look like? Uh, the bond amount isn't set until we go out for sale, technically, and for sure once we do the sale, uh, because the the building authority resolution hasn't been adopted yet, we're still probably about a month or two off from sale, so. Uh, the sale is probably going to be, uh, I would guess, sometime late July at this point. So we're still a month or two away from meeting the actual, the final, final amount. So why do we need a dollar amount in there to, to tonight then? Did you hear the question, Andy? Commissioner Swan was asking why they need a dollar amount in this particular resolution this evening. Uh, all resolutions have to have maximum parameters for the actual amount. Um, so we're doing maximum parameters until we can figure out the final amount. And that can always be increased as well as decreased? Can that be increased as well as decreased? adopting a new resolution anyways so we're trying to understand that process here so as part of the process is there another step you mentioned in july we'd be going out for the sale so would there be another resolution that they would be looking at in july that would set the exact dollar amount or what does that proportion of the process entail uh no i mean typically no it's up to the commission if they want to but typically um heather It would probably be Heather and the mayor would be allowed to set the final amount on behalf of the city as authorized signers. So the city, through the building authority, will set authorized signers to um, sign the documentation and they have the, the, the authority to set the final bar amount. So would it be appropriate if, say, um, Mayor Dennison and myself were to just assure the public and the commission that we would not, if, if they're indeed wanting to weigh in, which it sounds like they are, and I understand why, um, assure them that we would not do so until they have another vote um, to authorize us to do so. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, the commission, yeah, this stuff doesn't move forward until the authorized signers or the commission does some sort of action. So yeah, I mean, if they want to just give you the, the uh, direction that sign paperwork until we authorize an amount via the commission, then that's fine. Isn't, isn't that what we just changed it to? Like you said, you had to change the resolution. Yeah, so to, um, understand what we're to summarize, Andy, we, our last municipal building authority meeting, which was our first and only thus far, um, we actually as a group passed our own resolution indicating that we would not take action um, until there was city commission approval. So I would think that that likely achieves that goal. Does that seem to you like that would be the case? Based on the resolution we passed, that was our best effort to try to make clear that that's the intent, is that we're okay. not going to take action without majority commission approval. Okay. I think if we approve this resolution, then when the final number comes, then we'll come back and, and ask for approval before it's official. Correct. Before Mayor Dennis and myself sign, this matter will be back on the public agenda asking the city commissioners to vote. This, this just keeps the wheels moving. 
Correct, which is the next step in the process that Andy and Roger need to finish yeah, preparing. So, so. Uh, and, and that's what the power hog is, they have to have a power hog. That's a max, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay. This is um, this is to continue on the process because the the city has to through the building authority because the building authority is the issuer at the direction of the city. The city has to apply for the bond issue through the Department of Treasury. So uh, this process has to be done in this way for max parameters and everything early because uh, we have to apply directly to the Michigan Department of Treasury to get approval to issue the bonds. So we have to adopt all the resolutions and everything up front, get approval from the Department of Treasury, and then if the commission wants to do a final approval for, before sale, that's perfectly fine, but we need to have everything adopted and show that everything is approved before Trump, the Department of Treasury will um, even consider approving the bond issue on their end. That makes sense to me. Right. For public clarification, <coughs> we just have some differences of opinion on how much that bond should be, which is why all the questions came up. That's all. Any other questions for Andy while we have one forward before we let him go? Thank you, Andy. Yep. Okay. Okay, would anyone like to make a motion to approve res the resolution? Can you make it the motion to approve the uh, building authority to approve that resolution? Sorry, it's, it's actually the building authority's resolution. But because of that resolution we pass saying we won't move forward without commission approval, we need your authorization to pass it. I know that sounds circular. So this is your resolution. We, we need your permission to pass our resolution. So we say we. Because we didn't want to act so without your permission. The, per, the proper motion is I move to approve the building authority to pass. Resolution 2022.05 slash 002 as presented. Perfect. Okay. There you go. Was that a motion or a That was the motion. <laughs> uh, is, there, uh, is there support? I'll uh, support. Give it a roll. Salam? Yes. Denison? Yes. Weedon? Yes. Downey? Yes. Money? Yes. Harris? Thank you for that clarification. Okay. I think we're on to item 10, unfinished business, reconsideration of ordinance 2022-03430, the ITMC adoption, correct? Correct. And this would be a first read. Um, we did previously have a first read, but the first read we had initially had some blank spaces. Those have now been filled in. Um, it was just a few spots that were governing how many days notice people would have for various offenses. Sean, I'll make a motion to approve the first reading of Ordinance 2022.03-430, International Property Maintenance Code Adoption. Mr. President. Thank you. Is there support? I'll support. Do we roll call, please? Denison? Yes. Weedon? Yes. Downey? Yes. Money? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, city Manager, do you want to talk about the Certainly, my intention is to have a final budget proposal before the commission during our next meeting on June 27th that would be um, an amendment to what's been previously approved. Um, in furtherance of that, we do have a meeting scheduled with myself, our new Treasurer Deb, and Commissioner Swem uh, coming up later this week. If anyone would like us to expand that to have a full budget work session, I'm happy to do so. So I just wanted to take the temperature of the commission at this time, see if anyone else wanted me to schedule that. Um, if so, I'll be happy to do so, and if not, we can just discuss it during the, the June 27th meeting. So, does anybody else want to attend it? Any of you can make a motion on that. Uh, more than Mary or from the Otherwise, it doesn't like to be there. Okay. It's two. That's on the 27th. No, no, that's a standard meeting. So, if you want to come to the budget work session, that was going to be more of we were looking at was it Wednesday at 3 p.m. Yeah, Wednesday at 3 we're scheduled for that already. This Wednesday? This Wednesday. Yeah, the 15th, June 15 at 3 p.m. Actually, I think do you have enough time to even notice that if we have 3 
We do. Okay. Yep. So it's we're just going through the edits to the budget that will ultimately come back in front of the full commission for discussion. <coughs> Um, I can just jump right to the contract authorizations. Um, I'm asking the City Commission to consider authorizing me to sign the following pending contracts following the recent review of said contracts by the City Attorneys. A is the Bergman contract, where the architects for the DPW building. B is the ADD, who is construction managers for said building. And C, Brian and Newhoff, as earlier discussed, they are the engineers for the infrastructure projects for water and sewer, as well as the 23-24 redesign and reconstruction of Front Street. So my request is authorization to sign all three contracts um, upon uh, the recommendation of the city attorneys once they're finalized. Do they have any questions? Like to make a motion? Mm -hmm. I'll make the motion to authorize the city manager to sign the contracts with Bergman, ABB, and Prenda Newhoff as per the attorney's recommendation. Thank you. Is there support? I support. Good roll call, please. Donaldson? Yes. Leader? Yes. Dowie? Yes. Money? Yes. What? Yes. <coughs> All right, moving down to new business. The Moose parking lot for Trail on the Hill. And actually, that item A and B were both uh, removed from the agenda at the top of the meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Not paying attention. Um, Communications. We are. Got it. Nothing's All right, this time I'll open it up for public comment on non agenda items only. I'd like to make a public comment. Did we come in the public stay in the minutes? I don't need to go all the way over there. Norma, 304 North Oak. I'm at two. I would like to speak to you and city personnel regarding what I have heard tonight to see if we have our priorities in order for us, the residents. Second, I have filed a grievance with Comcast. I will be receiving, I hope, who just uh, quit having Channel 17. And I also have another committee who is willing to participate in paying for it that I need to have some information to share. So that's where I stand right now. Thank you, Norma. Anybody else want me to make a public comment? I'm also on the board at, at um, the Cannon Area Senior Center, and at the moment I'm not pleased with my fellow common people. But um, thank you for holding to your guns for what you should. Thank you. Anyone else wishes to make a public comment? Can I ask for a lollipop? I thought I did really well tonight. <laughs> Do you have a couple? Moving on to the city manager. Yes, I wanted to thank the public for um, braving a storm to join us this evening. We had some lively debate, and I think we addressed some tough issues, but we covered a lot of ground, so I thank everyone for their input and feedback. I do want to share, um, coming out shortly, the downtown business owners and others in the downtown area will be receiving a communication from our police department in, um, informing them of those changes in parking fees that the commission approved recently. So that will be going out and everyone will be receiving that so they're aware of that change before it's fully effectuated, which will be very soon. Um, I also wanted to update and thank Norma um, for your communications to Comcast. We did actually get another Comcast rep out here the other day, so they are still trying, they still haven't fixed it, but they assure us that they're still looking into it and providing assistance, so thank you for your advocacy, Norma, I appreciate it. I hope they contact you because I have several yep, as I, someone that would watch it. Yep, I hope they do too, Norma, so thank you everyone, I appreciate your time. Commissioner Reed? Uh, just to, to say welcome 
to Deborah Perez. And looking forward to it. Thank you. That's all. Commissioner Slim. I have a few questions tonight. So welcome, Deborah. So one of my first questions is actually for you. Um, we're seeing more and more of the rate increases industry wide, just talking about this like landfill. So great opportunity for us to just check and see what the rates are out there. I know there's groups just drooling over deposit money right now, so I might kind of see where we stand on some of that. Uh, second item I had was who is our number two in charge of the Main Street program once Ashley's on leave? Um, so at this point, we have not designated that person. They're having conversations internally as to what that would look like. Okay. My public service question that came up from a few residents this week, more of a comment, just questioning our scheduling on why we're on four tens. It doesn't need to be answered right now, just so you're aware. I got a few questions this week on that. Don't have an answer as to why we schedule that way. So, but it was like four different calls. So I'm sure there's a good reason. Just it came up a few times, so I figured I'd address that. Uh, had some interesting. Um, discussion with our auditor from plan related to some of our charges recently. You know, we had some recommendations for some commissioner committees getting established. So I think that's something we can talk a little bit more offline, kind of can help with our internal communication so we can accomplish some things. But like a, I'm sure there's a bunch of different ways, but I kind of look at the landfill model as something we should at least consider. That kind of will help some communication, I think. And last but not least, I was really, really impressed by the tree friends tonight. I mean, incredibly impressed related to their organization, how thorough they came, they had a plan, they talked budget, execution, working internally with groups, like that was a standard that, I mean, I know it takes time, but wow, that was great. Um, I think about them every day when I drive down Elizabeth Street, West Elizabeth Street, it is the nicest street canopy in the entire town. You don't go down that road, just kind of go down that road one time. Granted, there's no power lines, but I, I was really impressed with their execution tonight. And of course, some of them are still here to hear that, but um, I was <coughs> really proud to see that and uh, their willingness to want to work with our city. So, and the, the guys look like you're already very much. So, that was all I have. I heard it. Oh, yeah, I heard it. That's right. <laughs> Just like to welcome Deborah. Where's your money? Uh, Deborah, welcome aboard. Appreciate it. Uh, I know this is going to work out well for you. Well, I've got Mr. Baker here. Uh, I want to personally thank him because I haven't seen him since really Memorial Day for the work that they did. Uh, and his crews did at not only the cemetery, but the work that they put into Front Street for the parade and uh, just everything uh, that they did to clean up the city for uh, the Memorial Day Parade we had. Uh, it was a big event, way bigger than we've ever seen, so thanks, Mike, for doing that. Uh, I have to agree with Patrick. I think the Tree Friends, when, when they showed up, they were ready for business, and they did a great job. Um, get a chance to thank Rich and all of, the, all of the rest of them. Truly appreciate that. The same way with the uh, with the uh, senior center. I know they were a little disappointed when they abruptly moved out, but once again, I hope they understand uh, what we as a group have to do sometimes, you know. And it's just not to make everybody warm and fuzzy. Uh, sometimes you just gotta, you know, be the wet blankets, and I think you know that's what we turned out to be today. But uh, hopefully they'll come back and, and we can do something, you know, for them. That project that they're doing is a great project. Uh, I, I really foresee it uh, working out well. Too bad that you can take it back to them. But uh, um, <clears throat> this past weekend, uh, I got to listen to Mr. Dennison speak at our buck teams uh, and reveal a lot of his uh, past experience or he went to school in Pudville or somewhere like that. Uh, but it was really a great program. Thanks for the city of Buchanan for everything that they, they did to help promote that. Uh, 
Uh, I know that, uh, you know, as an alumni, I'm probably the only one here that gets to go after 40 years, but uh, uh, yeah, thank you for the city for doing everything. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. And it's Bumpville, my way. Bumpville? Bumpville. Is right. Right. I want to welcome our treasurer also. Welcome aboard. Um, wish you the best of luck. Um, a couple of things. One of the things that came up this past weekend was uh, some complaints about trash downtown. Um, and I and I just, as busy as our, you know, Patrick was telling me earlier that he came through town this weekend and it was, it was a traffic jam. I mean, there was so much going on in town this weekend. We had you know, the Buck teams, we had concerts on Thursday, we had concerts on Saturday, we had, I mean, there was just so much stuff going on, and there's so many people in town um, that we may want to rethink when we're emptying garbage. Go ahead. My guys actually came to me this morning that emptied the garbage cans and said we need to do some on the weekends because they're, they're Thursday they're not, no, by Friday. Friday night they're overflowing. Right. So, and I, and, and downtown was hot. It was. It was. I mean, it was. And I'm glad that you recognize that. That's all. I just wanted to make sure that I sent out a little reminder there. That it, I have not had time something. to talk to Heather yet, but I literally was going to ask if we could put somebody on um, it's, uh, Saturday morning to do a trash run because you have the farmer's market going I, th on. I think it's warranted. I think with as much foot traffic and, and people in town now. Maybe more garbage cans, too. They're pretty far apart. I there, there's agree. not many. There, we may want to think about it. But they are used We don't have any of the decorative trash cans. Those came with the downtown streetscapes. So, I mean, I'll put out the white barrels, but. No, I think no. we can be creative. That, Heather's our. No, I think if we can no. keep them, you know, just pay closer attention to maybe keeping them empty. I mean, I'd rather not have white barrels in our own. First but it, yeah. it may not, sorry, but it may not be a bad idea to get a little creative with additional ones that maybe look similar because with the additional people we've got throwing the hill in Chippewa Blues happening. I know we're going to deal with that, but well, yeah, no, no, this Saturday can, thing yeah, is but... not going to slow down. This right. is going to, it's going to pick up. So oh, I'm I... totally on board with coming in and having a <coughs> Saturday morning. Okay. Because right. nothing gets put in those trash cans until Friday night. Anyways, right. So right. it's not like I can do it Friday morning. Thursday night, Friday morning doesn't matter. Saturday morning is when they're full, especially when you have all the traffic. Right. You're already, you're already thinking about it, yeah. so that's good. Thanks, man. Um, the, I, the only other thing I wanted to do was apologize to uh, my fellow commissioners tonight for letting the meeting get out of hand. Um, I don't really care about Robert's rules, Dan. Um, I like the fact that we have back and forth. It's the only time citizens get to talk to us. Yeah. It's the only time we get to hear from them, so I like to, I like that. Um, but I let it get out of hand tonight. I apologize for that. Um, other than that, that's all I have. Thank you everybody for coming, for putting up with the weather, and hopefully nobody has any damage doing at home. So can I make a motion to adjourn? I make a motion. Thank you. Is there support? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, I Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.